So uh, today we have uh, Nicholas Kwan, who is the Director of Research at the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, who is going to speak to us about DRI in Hong Kong. And uh, he has a long history of, of working as an economist, as a certified financial analyst. I think he's worked for uh, Merrill Lynch, for the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, for Standard Chartered Bank. So uh, he uh, has deep knowledge of the subject about which he will uh, give you a guest lecture. We thank him very much for coming here to speak to us today. So please feel free to uh, ask questions of Mr. Kwan, uh, and uh, we'll put it over to him. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Professor Sherman. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about something which probably most of you know about already. But uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I never find some person who is uh, so convinced that they know it well. Uh, first, uh, let me show you the, my slides, uh, which is, uh, yeah. Uh, the topic I was given is talk, uh, to talk about uh, Hong Kong and the Belt and Road. Uh, and Let's see. Yeah. Uh, the first question to answer is what is Bear and Road Initiative? Uh, I guess most people think they know about it, but to be honest, uh, uh, when the initiative first started, I went up to Beijing and the lock on the door of most of the government department who are responsible or supposed to be responsible for this uh, initiative, including the uh, uh, <clears throat> the Ministry of Commerce, the Foreign Affairs, uh, NDRC, and whoever I know in uh, among the major think tanks in Beijing, they all give me different answers. Um, and then I was keep being asked about what is that initiative uh, by friends from outside or overseas. And most people have different views. Some people saying that it is a Chinese colonization program. Uh, the other people say that uh, it's just uh, that China want to uh, sell its overbuilt capacity, overbuilt products, and over, uh, over saved money. So it's a overflow from China to the rest of the world. And after a while, when I, uh, after my study, I find that it is actually impossible to find an answer to this question, what is BRI? Because even if I can manage to get President Xi Jinping to answer my question, there may still be a lot of people who don't believe in it. So what is the good way to see it is that what is in the program, what they want say they want to do and what they are doing and what can be achieved overall. So, with that will, I come up to that conclusion. It is a Chinese way of globalization, or globalization with the Chinese characteristics, to put it in a Chinese way. Um, that make more sense. Uh, globalization, of course, it includes everything. Many people see it from economics point of view. When it started, many people see it as an infrastructure related project. Uh, run largely by Chinese government or state-owned enterprises, which is actually what is going on, uh, what's happening in the early years uh, <clears throat> since the program is initiated. But then when you read the, uh, the details about the program itself, it contains not just infrastructure, but also all kinds of business and also go beyond business into social and other areas. So to make it uh, more uh, conclusive or inclusive in, in, one, in one way, uh, we can call it a globalization mm -hmm. effort. But it is literally for China's benefit, because uh, I don't think any country will do something which is not of, uh, for the benefit, but this could also be for the benefit of others. And it has to be because once you go beyond your border and want to secure the support and the cooperation of other people outside your country, it has to be something they see as beneficial. So to that extent, I would say that uh, it is something that China wants to reach out and hopefully 
on a win-win and uh, mutually beneficial way, both in terms of economic infrastructure as well as social and other aspects. But how can it work? Because this program come at a very bad time where the world is moving apart from each other. We have seen the last four years in America being uh, primarily driven for America first. And then we have seen Brexit, which is still ongoing, and which basically is a trend where you can see underlying trend uh, to split up the EU one way or the other, or at least to detach from a bigger Euro, uh, Europe. And all around the world, we have seen a wave of deglobalization ever since the last major financial crisis back almost uh, uh, 13 years ago. And in the middle of that, China come up with this idea of re-globalizing or connecting itself closer with the rest of the world. So it depends how you see yourself, which way is better, but it is running against the tide, one way or another. And to make it work, we really have to secure the support of whoever we want to link up with. And that's where we think Hong Kong can play a very important role. The reason for that is that to make this globalization initiative work, we need three elements, which is where Hong Kong fits in well. First, we need not just the participation by the Chinese entity, either the government, the enterprises, state-owned, uh, uh, private-owned, but also all the international community, whoever involved in this program outside of China. So international participation is critical for a success of program like that. It's very different from a 13 uh, or uh, the 14 five-year plan or the 13 five-year plan. Any five-year plan which are primarily domestically focused, it only need the cooperation and the support of the domestic elements. And China can do whatever they want. But when you go beyond your border and try to build a dam, try to build a highway across the country or on, in the other uh, countries' places, you need really full cooperation from those involved outside. So internationalization is very important and Hong Kong is typically strong in this area, which I will explain later on. The second thing is that it is such a grand plan that involves not just one or two countries, but basically every part of the world. And it involves not just government to government issues where you talk about policies and whatever, involve roads, infrastructures, cultural exchanges, which cut across different parts of the society and economy. So government forces itself will not be sufficient to drive for things like that. It has to be coming from the bottom, driven by the market, that people in all kinds of institute, as well as both academic business, as well as public and private sector, have to join force together. So the use of market force is critical in the success of this area, uh, this program. And lastly is how to manage risk. Once you go beyond your border, regulations is under other people's uh, command. Uh, rules and uh, orders are all different. So how can you manage that? So these are the three specific areas which we believe Hong Kong can play a role. If the uh, BRI were to succeed in a mutually beneficial way across the world, we have to add our input into this three element. And let me go one by one to explain why we see that and how we believe we can play a role on this. First about trade and commerce, when this whole program will start from economic side. <clears throat> Hong Kong is one of the most internationalized cities in China. Um, we have by number, the largest number of, or largest uh, <clears throat> group of foreign government representatives as well as foreign company representatives. We have about 4,000 foreign company registered here, either as a headquarter, regional headquarter or uh, regional offices. We have 122 foreign consulates, uh, which represent different governments uh, being uh, positioned here. The number is less than what you get 
in terms of embassies in Beijing. But being a long capital city, the number of foreign government representatives here, 122, is next only to one city around the world, which is New York. But New York is unfair to, compete, uh, to compare because New York have a UN headquarters there. Any UN members will have to have someone based in New York uh, to support that. So other than New York and some of the major capital cities like Beijing, Washington, DC, uh, London, or wherever, we, Hong Kong, have the largest number of foreign government representatives, consulates here. So when you talk about internationalization and uh, meeting different governments as well as business, here is the one uh, city which can give you all the connections. And for people who are uh, familiar with the business community, you may be aware that some or many of the foreign chamber of commerce, including American Chamber of Commerce, British Chamber of Commerce, EU Chamber of Commerce, Australian Chamber of Commerce, Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and even Japanese Chamber of Commerce, their member of chamber, uh, chamber members are one of the largest, if not the largest, of these chambers around the world. So that tells you how many business uh, or foreign companies have, uh, have someone uh, based here to want to look for business here. So if China were to go international and work with different business uh, representatives as well as governments, here is a pace which we can pay a very significant role. And of course, there are other areas like foreign residents, half a million, foreign business visitors, uh, except for this year, we have 7 million normally per, per year. And we have a large number of Hong Kong Business Association members around the world. So these are elements which can facilitate a lot more international uh, business through Hong Kong. The reason why we can do that, is, uh, other than history, is because we have a very different structure or system compared to other major cities in China. Uh, we call ourselves special administrative region with particular high level of autonomy in the commercial and other area, law and defense and law and diplomatic areas. So one particular area is that we have a free port status, which start, well, uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. A free port, um, for those who are familiar with China, they may have questions saying that now China have 18 provinces with different kind of free trade port already or free trade zone already. So what makes Hong Kong different compared with that? Uh, what we have in other parts of China in terms of free trade zone and free trade port is still substantially different from the status we have here as a free port. Because by free port, we mean the free flow of goods, services, capital, information, as well as tenant. I'm not saying that uh, everything is free of uh, control, but there's, to some extent, is a relatively minimal restrictions in the flow of these different entities or different elements. For instance, in terms of capital flow, we basically have low capital control and the currency is freely convertible. These two elements makes it very different from other parts, other free trade areas inside China. So because of that, actually, it facilitates a lot more easier, easily the trade flow, human flows, information flow between the China versus the rest of the world. And that's one, one thing which makes it very different to do things in Hong Kong. Some people keep you saying that uh, for those in information business is uh, to connect with the world outside, most people, particularly in the West, you may use uh, WhatsApp. To connect with people in, within China, you use WeChat. And there's seldom a place you can use both WeChat and WhatsApp together. Um, so that is why people value this place in terms of free flow of information, free flow of capital to conduct business. And because of that, we also have, uh, because of SAR status, we're also an independent tariff area. This is one uh, issue which is uh, being raised recently, when US uh, put in the sanction and say that uh, 
they would not recognize Hong Kong as an independent tariff area. Now they try to treat Hong Kong as part of the mainland in terms of tariffs as well as uh, trade issues. Uh, in fact, that is uh, just mostly talk. And until now, we don't know how they are going to do it because we are recognized as an independent tariff area or custom area, not just by the US before, but by basically everybody outside uh, around the world and under the WTO system. Um, that makes a difference between Hong Kong versus the rest of the mainland because uh, everybody are aware that it makes it quite difficult once, once, once you go and bring something into Hong Kong and then into China, you have to go through two customs, first into Hong Kong and then into the mainland. Uh, we are working very hard to make this custom formalities as um, convenient as possible, as minimal as possible uh, to facilitate more trade between the two places. But on the other hand, the custom is, has to be there. Otherwise we won't be qualified as an independent tariff area. This makes a difference for Hong Kong's function versus the rest of China. It's hard to imagine a country like China will have basically zero tariffs for all kinds of goods and no uh, custom duties for all kinds of uh, uh, products. Hong Kong is offering zero tariffs for everything. Uh, we can do it for a city, but it may not be beneficial for the, uh, to do it for a country as big as China, because there are sectors which need to be protected. And there are areas where we, you have to uh, use the tariffs that just the, um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the differences between the local as well as the foreign uh, environment. Here in Hong Kong, we are open to all this. So uh, give me one, uh, one interesting example, uh, because the, uh, our council runs a lot of exhibitions. Some of, some of them are among the top in the world. One of the largest exhibition we have is Food Expo, where we can we manage a lot of different foods to come into Hong Kong. The reason why they, uh, they uh, come in in a large scale is because our custom uh, formality is basically minimal, particularly for fresh food. If you have to go through different customs and quarantine procedures, uh, that will be very difficult. And if it's just for an exhibition, you may forget about all these uh, formalities because once you can uh, go through it and only for a small amount of your exhibitions, exhibit, uh, and then you have to ship it out again and uh, probably uh, adjust for your tariffs being paid or not. Then it's too much of a hassle for companies to do that. But because of our independent tariff area and uh, free post status, food import and export are at minimal, uh, uh, except for quarantine purpose, uh, minimal custom uh, procedures. So that helps a lot in attracting all those food companies to, ex to participate. And we get the benefit of having the able, uh, having be able to uh, see all kinds of or taste all kinds of food products here. Because of our um, SAR status or uh, autonomy in terms of <coughs> trade and uh, commercial areas, we managed to have independent economic agreements with different foreign parties, aviation agreements, shipping agreements, tax agreements, tax uh, visa fee agreements, etc. Um, we have close to 250, uh, by, uh, uh, 250 bilateral uh, agreements and 260 multilateral agreements being signed between Hong Kong and different parties of the world. And this makes a big difference in terms of connecting with the rest of the world. Uh, take visa, for example, we have 165 country visa fee uh, for the Hong Kong SAR passport. Uh, there's one real case I can share with everybody. Uh, when we start with the, uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Bay and Road project, one area which has been talked about a lot uh, um, uh, for the Bay and Road development is, the, is Kazakhstan. Um, it's a big country with a lot of resources but pretty far from Hong Kong, it's in Central Asia. But uh, I try to send a, one of my colleagues there to understand the situation and see what we can do. And one of my colleagues in mainland uh, who are based in uh, 
covering the west of uh, China, uh, also want to join uh, the tour. So I told them that uh, we are happy to have him on the way, but uh, I'm not going to slow down my process. And I'm, I, I told my colleagues to work together and get there, do the study. By the time my colleagues come back from his visit, my colleague in China is still working on his visa. So we have the advantage of having visa fee status and even have a direct flight. My colleagues in China, he has, even if he get managed to get a visa uh, to go to Kazakhstan, which is just next to China, he still have to fly to one or two of the places like Beijing or Xinjiang before he can fly into Kazakhstan. So sometimes uh, ge uh, geography seems to be uh, uh, an advantage for some countries to be approached directly from the mainland. But in fact, because of our uh, connections, it probably makes it easier to do it from Hong Kong. So these are the areas why we think that in terms of logistics, there's quite a lot of things we can offer. One very simple example is that because of this uh, autonomy in terms of aviation uh, agreements, Hong Kong have more international flights connecting us with uh, the rest of the world than the combined flights, international flights of Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. So when you want to connect outside, that's why we see a lot of transit uh, passengers from the mainland or from outside that go via Hong Kong into the other, other part of the world. This itself makes a big, big difference when you have to do business, particularly in very short period of time. The third area is infrastructure. To be honest, Hong Kong's infrastructure some of those are pretty outdated. Uh, we have built infrastructure uh, well ahead of the others, but similar to some of the uh, country in the West, uh, because they built early, they also old, uh, uh, get obsolete early. But we have been able to keep up most of our infrastructure service. Uh, what particular, what's particular about Hong Kong is that because the BRI starts with mostly infrastructure projects, First, we don't think we have any big company here in Hong Kong who are capable to build uh, big bridges, airports, whatever. Most of the construction companies here in Hong Kong is specializing in residential and uh, uh, commercial properties, but not so much in infrastructure because our infrastructure has been a long time ago. And recently, whatever is being built is done by mostly foreign and mainland companies. But what is strong or special about Hong Kong is the way we build as well as to run infrastructure. Uh, one particularly interesting point is that most, most part of the world, you will find that infrastructure is an area primarily done by the government or the public sector. Telecommunication, power, port, rail, airport, all this in most countries, they were run by the government or funded by the government. Here in Hong Kong, we make a big difference, partly because of the colonial uh, heritage that uh, previously the government doesn't really want to shoulder too much of this uh, huge investment. They have been subcontracting most of these infrastructure projects to private sectors. Our power generation and power distribution is run by two private companies, our port, is run primarily by a few companies, but not just running, but building. Uh, the whole port is being built by private companies and run by them. Telecommunication was on franchise basis done by private sector. And it's only the rail and the airport are basically funded and built by the government, but still runs in a uh, quasi government entity which are basically a corporate entity. So because of that, actually we built a skill of using market force, a private sector element to build, to plan and to run and to service infrastructure projects. And what is special about that is that it makes our services not just buildable or uh, relatively efficient, but also sustainable. 
because private sector, if there's no profit, they won't run it. But on the other hand, because it's public service, we can't allow them to be too profitable. So we have a formula to make sure that it is in, this kind of infrastructure is being provided in a sustainable, commercially viable, and relatively efficient way. Most people who travel on subways around the world, particularly in the major cities in the West, will appreciate that the subway in Hong Kong is, is relatively cheap and efficient. And that's why our real uh, subway companies running subways, not just here in Hong Kong, but in, also in China, but also in many of the uh, Western countries like Australia, Sweden, and UK. Two of our major port companies, both are private uh, or basically listed uh, uh, companies here, have running, uh, are running more than a hundred ports around the world in more and close to 50 countries. Uh, the 26 countries I highlight here is just for one company. So the other one have another 25 or 26 countries uh, post running. Our power company is running power plants and building plants and all kinds of power facilities around the world, including both developing and developed worlds. So these are the expertise that um, Hong Kong can provide in terms of infrastructure service. Um, the difference is here is that you won't see a big name uh, like whatever construction company who are in the, uh, uh, in the building uh, or construction site of those big infrastructure projects. Most of our uh, input is in service time, either in architecture or management or whatever. Uh, so you, many people ask me, can you name me some of the big if, uh, BRI projects being done by Hong Kong companies? I said that uh, it's quite a few, uh, but you may not see the name because they are subcontractors or they are sub subcontractors and they're providing only one of the uh, service in the whole project. But mind you, these, are, these services are critical if you are operating it in an efficient rate. The other area is about finance, which I think I don't need to explain too much. Uh, most, most people heard about that. But I would like to highlight the uniqueness of why Hong Kong make a difference. Because under the SARL status of uh, the autonomy, Hong Kong can manage to have its own currency, which can uh, is freely convertible. And under the basic law, we are not supposed to impose any exchange control. And because of the history of this authority of uh, this, uh, the way we run our currency, we have built a very credible, uh, 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 strong credibility in having a monetary system that is free and efficient. Um, and on top of that, we also have our fiscal autonomy. We don't pay tax to the central government and we uh, run very differently because uh, some people complain that Hong Kong could have fiscal problem because uh, our tax base is very narrow. But surprisingly, except for this year and a few years before, this government constantly run huge surplus. The problem of the government is how to get rid of the surplus. And they have accumulated large uh, reserves. Uh, seldom in other parts of, uh, of the world, you see a government sitting on too much reserve. And the problem is how to spend it. So all of this actually helps in our financial status and make, our, uh, make us being one of the major international financial center. Uh, on the other side, I have listed some of the rankings we have in terms of IPO, in terms of offshore RMB, in terms of ethics. And a few things I like, like to highlight is that in terms of ethics, we are like ranked number four, fourth in the world. This is total amount of FX tra uh, transaction each day. They count on daily basis. Uh, each day we have about 700 billion US dollar transact uh, in our FX market. And that makes us number four in the world, next to London, New York, and slightly just behind, marginally behind Singapore. But when you talk about specific, specific currency, like US dollar, which is the largest volume of uh, trans uh, transact currency in the FX world, we are actually number three. Uh, we are slightly more than uh, Singapore in that area. And this is uh, not just 
we are ranked number three, but in fact, it is very important that the amount of US currency transacted each day here in the you know, Hong Kong FX market, which is about 610 billion, the latest count, uh, is almost half of all the US dollar transacted in US uh, each day. So in that sense, while the US dollar has been the world global currency, once you go outside the US, other than London, Hong Kong is the largest uh, center for US dollar trading. And it tells you why, how important we are because we handle half of what the domestic market is handling each day. And there's somebody uh, highlight recently when we talk about our relationship with the US where some sanctions on trade is being imposed. And there are talks about uh, sanction in the financial, say, uh, financial area. And some people concerned that to what extent the Hong Kong dollar could be affected because we pack ourselves to the US dollar. Uh, it could be affected if they do something uh, uh, <clears throat> drastic. But on the other hand, it's not going to hurt just Hong Kong, but it will hurt US more because they are disrupting one of the second largest ethics market of US dollar outside of US. Um, so there's other areas which uh, we see very relatively important in terms of banking, uh, fund management, private equity management, which is particularly important for startups and innovative sectors. So all these are important for the BRI because we talk about large, huge projects, talk about billions uh, worth of projects. You are not going to expect the government to fund it. Um, the two major development banks in China, the Exim Bank, Export Import uh, Bank, and the China Development Bank, has already been lending overseas, supporting all these overseas uh, projects, as much as all the major multilateral central uh, multilateral banks, uh, development banks doing, including the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, European Development Bank, or Reconstruction and Development Bank. African, Latin American, all together, their lending is less than what Chinese, uh, China, uh, China Development Bank and China Exim Bank has been lending. So imagine how much more you can expect these two more two banks to extend their, uh, their foreign lending. And if they can't do it, what, well, where are they going to get the money to support these BRI projects? It has to be come from the market, from the private sector. And wherever you can raise money, particularly RMB related uh, funding, because a lot of those are China related and to re minimize the exchange risk, you, uh, you better to have one leg of the transaction on RMB or at least link up or hedged against RMB. So all this makes Hong Kong unique in terms of the BRI project funding. Funding is uh, for projects is one area, but on the other hand, a lot of those are done in terms of uh, direct investment. And here again, Hong Kong stands out uh, quite clearly. In terms of accumulative or stock of direct investment, Hong Kong is number three in terms of inward. In terms of outward, the last year uh, we dropped to number seven, but honestly, we are still very close to number three position because from three to seven, the, uh, there's only small margins of differences. And somewhat the statistics is uh, distort distorted by the US regulations. Uh, a year ago, until 2018, Hong Kong has been ranked number two in both inward and outward direct investment around the world. And suddenly we dropped one, uh, one place in, outward, uh, in the inward side and dropped seven place in the outward side primarily because there's a change in accounting uh, um, and uh, capital flows. Uh, you know that the US has changed the rate of taxing those US corporates who are holding their earnings overseas. Um, to make things simple, the US has been uh, imposing tax on those uh, money being the uh, US company earned overseas if they were to remit back to the US. So many US companies just uh, hold on to those earnings, foreign earnings. And that's part as foreign power investment by the US. And after the tax regulation changes, 
Now, many U.S. companies make use of that change and shift the guard earning back to Hong Kong, back to the U.S. And some of those actually may try also make use of different other entities' tax uh, uh, changes and re, uh, reallocate the investment into uh, the foreign subsidiaries. And to that extent, it actually distorts a bit of the ranking. But to simplify the case, we are constantly among the top two, three position in terms of foreign investment overseas. One other things I want to highlight is that if you look at the list here, except for Singapore and Ireland, uh, to some extent, maybe Netherlands, most of this investment are basically for those uh, 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 countries who are accepting them. So the US investment that going into US uh, is for investing in the US. Those who are going into UK are for investing in the UK. But Hong Kong is special. If you talk about 1.8 trillion US dollar being invested in Hong Kong, everything will be very expensive. To be honest, we serve only as a conduct for direct investment. Many of these investment, after they come to Hong Kong, they find their way to other places. In the old days, is foreign investment come to Hong Kong and then we invest into China. So that makes us a large a top area for inward investment as well as a top source for outward investment. The same is true for Singapore to some extent, Ireland and Netherlands. These are conducts for direct investment. Why is that important? Because under the BRI, you can imagine that a lot more capital flow will be conducted between China and the rest of the world, either in or out. And mostly probably in the early days is from China to other places. And increasingly, there may be cross investment to and fro. Um, they need the place who can facilitate that flow. It's not to say that they can't do direct, but going direct is different from going indirectly. Why? Tech could make a difference. And by doing investment through a conduct like Hong Kong, you capture the benefits not just from tax, but also all the facilitations like investment protection, where Hong Kong has invest investment protection between Hong Kong and the other places, while China may not. Um, same, same is true. Uh, by going through Hong Kong, like uh, not just investment protection, but your IP protection could be different because a Hong Kong entity uh, versus those uh, from the mainland would be different in terms of the IP uh, protection. Now, the way you can manage your, uh, not just finance, but also the operations by finding people in and out of China versus finding people in and out of Hong Kong to support your operation overseas, that makes a difference. So recently we did a study actually on quite a number of companies and how, why they are using Hong Kong and what they are using Hong Kong for. Quite a number of say, uh, people saying that, or companies saying that, they come here because they see it as the facilitator for, uh, for capital flow, for people flow, for uh, information flow, etc. So back to the earlier one, when I mentioned about uh, our specialties in terms of free port. Again, this is one area which you can facilitate a lot more investment flows. If BRI were to take off, you will see that coming through more and more uh, flows uh, through Hong Kong. The last thing I want to highlight is the professional services. Um, we talk about trade, we talk about uh, investment and finance. In fact, to make these flows uh, efficient and viable, you need the support of a lot more other services in terms of legal accounting, uh, consulting and other risk management services. Here is a high, we have a high concentration of these service firms or professional service firms. We have more than half of the group of 100 law firms based here. Uh, we only have about 10,000 lawyers, uh, both local and foreign. But on the other hand, if you were to look for the top lawyers in terms of uh, patent, uh, particularly those familiar with the uh, uh, China environment, uh, if you were to, uh, were to look for the top lawyers in, uh, who, are handle, who, can handling, uh, who can handle shipping, aviation, and those things, quite a number of those you can find here. 
So these are the kind of supporting services uh, where we can uh, offer to the BRI projects. Accounting is another key uh, uh, area. Uh, we have a lot of our professional body. Their qualifications actually are in international center. Either they were fully recognized uh, by the other international bodies or they are compatible with other international uh, standards that, so that uh, can qualify them to work across border. Um, so I don't want to highlight more, but uh, legal services, one thing which are particularly important. Uh, when you work across border, anything you want to, uh, any problem you have, you want a uh, certain kind of legal prote uh, protection. Uh, the thing that makes Hong Kong different from the rest of the mainland is that it is the only common law regime uh, we have in China. And this common law regime is not just because it has a different system. Common law regime is particularly prevalent for international commerce and finance. Uh, think about the UK and the US who dominate those two areas for uh, centuries. Most of those business were done under this kind of uh, legal uh, system. So it would be much more convenient if you have someone who operate in this kind of system to facilitate these international flows. Uh, recently, we have been working with the government, um, the legal area, try to promote Hong Kong's legal services. Uh, we are not saying that um, you have to use Hong Kong particularly, but when you go abroad, particularly in BRI countries, many of those are developing countries, they have their own system of uh, their own legal system. And China, the mainland has their continental uh, system. Quite often you will find that either party would not be comfortable enough to use the other side's legal uh, system for as the base for the, uh, uh, for the project. And so that comes to the point that they have to come to someone or third party, both side have then kind of uh, comfort and confidence to use. And Hong Kong is one of those. Uh, in fact, London, Paris, Hong Kong uh, are some of the uh, major international legal centers that provide this kind of service. But Hong Kong is only uh, one of the major ones uh, which can provide you the, also the comfort to work with the mainland. And in terms of legal infrastructure, we have uh, quite a number of arbitration centers, which are the only one outside of the mainland that will have the uh, verdict uh, or judgment being uh, accepted by the mainland itself. So these are all the differences which can make uh, for foreign parties who are dealing with China and to find the comfort of working international or on international uh, standards. So all this uh, on the commercial side, we can tell that why Hong Kong can make a difference when uh, China has to reach out to the rest of the world in terms of economic and other areas. And to take it forward, if you see the whole BRI project as a Chinese program to internationalize and globalize or connect better with the world, and Hong Kong may be too small for that, then you have to look into our backyard, which is the Greater Bay Area. The whole Greater Bay Area actually captured the same idea, which is different from Hong Kong, in terms of legal system, monetary system. But this area is the most open, most international and most market driven area or region in the mainland. And many of those changes introduced over the last four decades to in the mainland starts from here. So if we were to build up the momentum for China to reach out overseas, and if we, went, we can make this Greater Bay area closer to both sides, to connect the mainland versus the, the rest of the world and work more like Hong Kong as well as the, the, the other part of the mainland. It will just make the whole Bay, uh, Bay and Road uh, facility uh, program much, much easier and much more momentum. So that's why I say the GPA actually is China's BNR pioneer. Um, and again, the key thing is that this is a region which is most open, which can help to reinforce globalization. It is most market driven, which can promote market reform, both inside as well as outside China. And it's the most international uh, region, which can offer a group, uh, uh, follow global practice and adopt the global practice much easier. 
So I hope I can basically highlight why Hong Kong is different. Uh, of course, things have been changing. Uh, there would be very interesting questions being raised over the years with all the developments, both locally as well as internationally. And I hope um, that can help you to understand more. But uh, if there's any question, I'm happy to um, respond to it. <laughs>